Hey, thanks again for joining us. Uh, I'd like to just invite our first kind of speaker. Uh, his name is Dr. Steve Coe. Uh, I say Dr. Steve Coe because he's actually a literal doctor who was uh, a doctor for the CDC. Um, and so he's both been a physician as well as uh, a pastor of Three Stone Church now, which is a church in the Lower East Side and in Chinatown, which has a rich history in the city. And he has a very unique perspective to offer us. And he actually just published a, um, a, um, an article for the Alliance and um, the CMA, which is a denomination that he's part of. And I would love for him to first, if you can just go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, Dr. Steve, um, he's typical kind of underachieving New Yorker. Um, and so if you can just introduce yourself and I would really love for you to start with just with your background, what, what really does, uh, you, your article talked about sacrifice, sacrificial love in this season. Um, if you can just share about what that looks like um, in this moment in our city's history, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Drew, thanks so much for having uh, me and in particular for hosting this session for New York City pastors. I believe it's really a, a critical time in our history, not only for the next generation, but also for the silent generation. So as you mentioned, I am senior pastor of New York Chinese Alliance Church, which is a CNMA church uh, in Manhattan. Uh, before God called me to full-time ministry, I served as a physician an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and also at Boston University. And so uh, for me personally, uh, it was about a month and a half to two months ago as uh, we were watching the news of the spread of coronavirus over China that the Holy Spirit really started convicting me to lean into this, uh, realizing that this outbreak and epidemic could really turn into a pandemic. And unfortunately, that has occurred. So, you know, just to share a little bit about your question, what does sacrificial love look like? You know, it took 67 days from the first reported case to reach the first 100,000 cases of COVID-19. Then 11 days for the second 100,000 cases. And just four days for the third 100,000 cases. Just in the last couple of days, I think we've gone over 400,000 in the globe, uh, globally. Unfortunately, New York City has become the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in America. As you well know, the streets are barren, stores are closed and subways are empty. Yet the number of cases continues to rise. Every one in 600 people in New York City is infected with COVID-19, an alarming attack rate. The healthcare system is really on the brink of disaster with the paucity of hospital beds, intensive care units, and ventilators. Why is this? It's because of our population density, which makes coronavirus so easy to spread. Manhattan is the most densely populated county in America. Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens are second, third, and fourth. And most everyone, probably on this call, lives in high-rise apartments and condos. And so contact with our neighbors is almost inevitable within elevators, mm -hmm. stairwells, and hallways. Yet this is precisely the reason we must embrace the sacrifice of social distancing. You see, social distancing removes the critical ingredient for transmission, human reservoirs. And as a new virus, our bodies do not yet have immunity against COVID-19. Researchers have not had time to create vaccines and the medical community does not know the best way to treat the disease. And that's why it's crucial to self-isolate. Although it's an incredibly difficult time for everyone, social distancing can flatten the curve. You've seen it on the news of COVID-19 infections, slowing the spread of disease while resulting in fewer deaths and less stress on the medical system. In the end, it's pretty ironic that the way we can most demonstrate love for our neighbors is to stay away from them right now. We have this unique opportunity to save the lives of others, especially the elderly and those with coexisting medical decisions, uh, really through the sacrifice of uh, social distancing. I want to let you know, everyone on the call, that I'm here for you personally. If you have any questions, whether they're medical or public health related, 
I, I also serve on the New York City Department of Health, Community and Faith-Based Affairs Advisory Council. So uh, feel free to email me, uh, message me on Facebook uh, Messenger. Uh, happy to uh, lean in and help as much as I can. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Hey, one quick question for you. Would, what, what would you say, so, so yes, we're supposed to isolate and distance. As the church, tangibly, like if we do say some of us want to help out our neighbors somehow, what would be the best way to do that then? Is it just stay sheltered where we are? And I think in some ways, that's been a tension I know that myself, along with my wife, we've been constantly kind of wrestling with. Um, yeah, wonderful question. In fact, uh, ironically, I just did a follow-up interview with Haven Radio, uh, Charles Morris, and he asked the exact same question. And I think this is an uh, extraordinary time. Uh, social distancing and isolation does not necessarily mean a lack of fellowship and community and worship. I think in particular, we are called to serve our neighbors in creative ways, uh, whether it's uh, buying groceries for the elderly through Fresh Direct or Amazon Prime, it is continuing to worship and uh, do Bible studies and uh, discipleship groups uh, via Zoom or Google Hangouts, or it's keeping up with those that are lonely and depressed over WhatsApp and Line. I think there are many, many different ways that we can lean in and love in this uh, era of social distancing. And the reality is that none of this would have really been possible 25, 30 years ago. But in this season of the COVID pandemic, God has given us these creative tools, which I believe generation Y and Z, the next generation can lead on. I know we're gonna hear from a lot of different pastors, but I in particular am learning even from the evangelism class I teach on the ways that they're reaching out, evangelizing and, and loving. That's great. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, hey, we're gonna have some time for questions and answers later. And if you have any, just write it in the, ch uh, in the chat box as well. Um, Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, again, if you just joined us, we're gonna be hearing from different pastors in New York about how we've approached, especially this unique season that we're in and ways that the church can really um, rise up to the occasion. Uh, would like to introduce my friend, Rich Velotis, who's the lead pastor of New Life Fellowship in Queens. Rich, maybe if you can just share a little bit of your background, uh, your context, and then just share as it relates to worship, discipleship, and mission. What, what have been the ways that you guys have creatively approached it in this season? Yeah, uh, I am a native New Yorker, born and raised in East New York, Brooklyn, lived there for 34 years, and uh, I'm a Queens transplant now, so I've been in Queens for the past six years, so uh, four decades uh, in this city. I pastor New Life Fellowship Church in Queens. Uh, I've been here for uh, 12 years and have been the lead pastor uh, since 2013, and so uh, I'm in my seventh year. Um, in terms of how we are responding, my, my main goal as a lead pastor and the phrase I've been using is to maintain meaningful connection. And that's the phrase that I've been repeating on a regular basis uh, because uh, there's people that are really connected, uh, but not necessarily meaningfully. Uh, you could be connected uh, watching cat videos and such, but uh, I'm, I'm really interested in the kind of spiritual and emotional connection that this opportunity provides. And so to that end, I'll just kind of rapid fire. I know there's like a five minute thing here. So I'm just gonna go rapid fire in terms of some of the things that we've been doing and thinking through um, even as we are in this whirlwind of uh, COVID-19. And so uh, first of all, um, my task has been just to have off a regular pastoral communication with our congregation. Um, New Life is a, um, it's a sizable congregation. There are about anywhere between 1,800 to 2,000 folks that are part of our church. And um, so lots of people to communicate to. And so on every Thursday, I just send out a kind of a, a weekly uh, overarching uh, statement on how we are adapting and responding to this new reality and offering, uh, you know, just some hope as well to our congregation. So that's just the one thing, just regular pastoral communication. Um, I've also taken on the task of leading midday prayers and I opened it up for our congregation. Others have joined in, but every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, actually right from this spot right here, um, I lead a 15-minute midday prayer. 
And uh, we've been shaped by monasticism over the years. And uh, our first M as a church, our values that we're a monastic community. And um, kind of like Bonhoeffer was created a monastic community during the time of Hitler's reign of chaos and such. I think the rhythms of prayer and being with each other are important and technology offers that uh, opportunity to do that. And so midday prayers have just been an important way to spiritually uh, connect with our people. Um, we created a master Excel spreadsheet um, and uh, some of the stuff is stuff I'm sure many of you are already doing just to reiterate. Um, and on that, we've had just a list of the elderly. Uh, New Life is a multi-generational congregation. And so we have a number of people who are 65 and older. And so those elderly, um, those who are medical um, professionals, uh, those who are single parents, those who that we are aware of who have uh, who are particularly uh, vulnerable in terms of whether they're immunosuppressed and such. And so um, we created a master spreadsheet with various tabs. And it is to that end that we are releasing pastors and deacons and leaders uh, to be in contact with these folks. And so um, we've already started last week calling people, praying with them. Um, for many folks, we don't get through, but I just think the gesture of stepping uh, moving towards others to say, hey, we want to pray for you and we want to chat has been an important piece of maintaining a meaningful connection in our congregation. And that's how we discover some particular needs um, that we can um, creatively respond to. Uh, we have a health center that many of you know of. It, it remains open and we are, we are serving the homeless community that we typically do. Um, and we've partnered with Restore for women who've been sex trafficked. And so um, one day a week as well, we offer um, uh, some support uh, and relief in that context there. Um, i also note we created a website called help at newlife.nyc. Uh, in a congregation our size, we're not going to be able to reach everyone. And so for folks who just need pastoral connection and want to talk to someone, they can send us that email at help at newlife.nyc and one of our deacons or pastors or elders respond um, to them. Uh, our uh, small groups, we've continued our small groups. We have um, many different small groups that meet around the city and I'm encouraged that about 70% of our small groups that have been meeting in, uh, recently are continuing to meet in a context much like this. And so our task now is equipping people who have never heard of Zoom and things of this nature. Uh, and uh, so we're still doing that. I'm still training people. I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm called to train people. And I'm training seven people in preaching via Zoom uh, starting next month. And so whatever content that I uh, train people with uh, in person, I'm doing it online here. And I'm actually thinking about having them preach online as opposed to waiting till we get back to do live labs. Uh, and so that's just an idea. Uh, I want to just continue to train and our pastors are continuing to create spaces to equip people in our congregation. I'll mention three more things, Drew. Um, um, we are still live streaming our services. Um, we have less than 10 people in the room and it's a big room. So we're, we're very much um, uh, holding on to social distancing. Um, the, we have a, a database called Church Community Builder. Some of you probably have that as well. Uh, we have uh, our pastor, Peter Roden, for the past number of four or five years, he's been the champion of it, getting everybody's information on this. And one of the best things you can do, I think, is populate that database because it's made our lives so easy to reach people. And so um, the hub has been, we call it the hub, has been great. Um, lastly, I'd just say, um, uh, I've been thinking about just the collective PTSD that our um, yeah. uh, people are going to be experiencing uh, when we return, uh, whenever that day comes. I'm very suspicious of people. I went to CVS to get some medicine for my son, and I was dodging people like I was Barry Sanders. And so um, I think, uh, what does it look like for us to recognize the collective PTSD and process that as pastors is something just we have to be aware of. And then lastly, um, you know, holding on to the tension of embracing limits and sacrifice. And um, we have, we were thinking about parents and how to resource parents. But listen, I'm the assistant dean now of the homeschool academy um, and, and uh, that meets every day. And uh, I was thinking, man, if my church sent me some stuff to do uh, with my kids, I have no time to do it. And so... 
I think we have to be mindful of the content that we're putting out. People have no time to do this. And so how do you meaningfully connect with people while recognizing some limits? And as pastors, I've been trying to, as a pastor, I've been trying to hold on to the limit of my own self-care as well, uh, because I find myself working even harder than usual, um, even though I'm not seeing people. So those are just a few things, Drew, that um, I'm thinking through and processing. Thanks so much, Rich. Hey, we'll have some time for questions for Rich later on if you have. Uh, thanks for sharing all that. Now, obviously, that's one context in Queens of a larger church. Uh, I'm going to ask Jordan Rice, uh, pastor up in Harlem in Manhattan. Uh, Jordan, if you can go ahead and share just some of the things that have stirred you guys and how you've approached this um, crisis that we're in right now. Um, feel free to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. So, yeah, obviously, we're in unprecedented times, and we've been giving a lot of thought to different things. So I'll just kind of go rapid fire as well. Uh, for worship stuff, you know, we're obviously trying to make sure that we're capturing people's data and that our worship services that we record in advance are really edifying people. But there's a lot of different articles and stuff on how people are being uh, met through our online services. But one thing that I've been really noticing the last couple of days is that the people who kind of lean towards the missional community side of things right now are finding really great ways to connect powerfully with their people. And man, it's really beautiful to see. And the people who are lean more on the evangelism side uh, are starting to see the power of online and in different ways and be able, able to reach people really far from God that they weren't able to reach. And that's really beautiful to see. I say all of that to say all of us have a leaning and um, I think it'd be really powerful to make sure that you're celebrating and stepping back and making sure you're learning from the other quote unquote camp of people and not just kind of putting doubling down on your side right now. I think it would be kind of short sighted of us to just continue doing things the way we had been doing it. So if you're a type of person that leans toward the missional community side, make sure you're looking at what people are doing on the other side of the fence um, and, and vice versa for sure. And everybody does have a leaning. None of us are, you know, hitting the bullseye. Um, in terms of discipleship, we basically boil down discipleship to its basic elements from, for us right now, which is connection and edification. So zero people in the history of the world have been discipled that have had no connection. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a transfer of information. We're, we're trying to figure out how do we meaningfully connect and then how do we edify people. So what we're doing right now is we're launching basically a, a renaissance Zoom channel that would be like a one-stop shop for people and there'll be a schedule on our website that people you can see what are the things that are being offered so you know events like marriage ministry event where we'll do some stuff that we've stole from stolen from new life their marriage ministry and uh, having a, a night where couples just get together grab a glass of wine on zoom and there'll be a talk for about 15 or 20 minutes then the zoom facilitator kicks people out and puts them in like small group for small group conversation and then we can practice a skill that we've learned and then come back to the large group conversation so you know w the things that we've been trying to do for a long time which are like you know um biblical more serious biblical study uh we're launching our renaissance institute it, that's going to be on our zoom channel that's gonna be like an eight week systematic theology thing that's being taught um so one of the huge bonuses are of the coronavirus is that the disruption that it's causing really is giving, it's leading, leaving us, leading Renaissance towards trying new things that we think are gonna be helpful. So for us, we wanted, we value simplicity. So we want people to know exactly they can just go to one spot and from morning devotion to midday prayer to faith and finances in the evening, they can just go to one channel that will be our Renaissance channel. And if you buy a certain plan on Zoom, you can get a, a vanity uh, plan as well to just, uh, just have your, your actual church's name at zoom.us. Zoom so that's what we're doing for connection, um, for discipleship. And then for mission, we wanted, in our neighborhood, if you, the Big C Church has a really bad stigma in Harlem for being too self-interested. And we knew that it would hinder our ability to talk about the glory and, and the beauty of Christ uh, if we just were pushing out theological content but weren't meeting any needs. So what we did is we basically fast forwarded our missional, um, our, our outreach budget. And we just said, well, we're very likely not spending money on Easter and different things like that. We're gonna give away our entire offering this Sunday to meet the needs of people in the neighborhood. 
So if you go to Renaissance or if you live in Harlem and if you're an atheist, it doesn't matter if you live in Harlem or if you go to Renaissance and you're negatively financially affected by, uh, impacted by the coronavirus, then we're giving away our entire offering. We're hoping to raise $50,000 to give away. And so far what that's done is it's allowed us, it's given us so much more platform now to talk about Jesus because now we don't live under this suspicion that we're only about ourselves. So whether it's a portion of your offering, um, it doesn't have to be certainly 100%, everybody's in a different financial state. Uh, I think it could be really helpful for people to know that your mission of not just being a church that's for yourself and surviving, but also seeking to bless the neighborhood, that could be really, really helpful. Um, and we've seen a lot of people really rally around this, both in our church and also on the outside. And and our church, are you know, they're more and more bold to talk about. They're, the people who go to our church now are even more bold to talk about uh, Christ right now because of what our church is doing. So we've seen that as a huge thing um, that we're able to meet needs by giving people basically 250 bucks to buy groceries, pay their cell phone bill or something like that. So that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Love it, Jordan. Um, again, if you, you have questions for him, you can write in the chat box and we'll get to questions and answers later. Uh, now, uh, um, Logan Gentry, who's a pastor of a church in Tribeca, Lower Manhattan Community Church. Logan, can you just share some of the, the ways that you've been approaching worship, discipleship and mission in this season? Um, that'd be great. Yeah, Drew, thanks for, thanks for organizing the call. Um, I was trying to figure out how to join uh, the Renaissance Zoom uh, channel the entire time. So uh, I'm a little distracted. Love what you guys are doing, Rich and Jordan. Thanks for leading the way and modeling that for us. Um, you know, for me, um, I had to make the transition personally from disappointment and discouragement into dreaming. Um, and to say like, this is not what we planned for, but let's use this as an opportunity. Uh, the church always shines brightest in the middle of these dark times. And so um, for us at LMCC, um, we've been on this journey for a while of just trying to follow the spirit. And I think in this moment, I've been really grateful to God that he's prepared us way before we even knew we needed it for a lot of things. Um, and it just has kind of shined through in this, you know, the, I've told our church, there's really two phrases that are going to guide a lot of what we do. Uh, it's embrace wisdom and it's reject fear that there is the wisdom and the truth of God that we have to pursue and go after. And it's going to guide all of our decision-making, but we're not going to be held captive by fear and we're going to push forward for the gospel. Um, and that's guided what we've done. So for, uh, for worship, we were doing live stream, but we had never invested in it. Um, it was just kind of a backup, you know, for our family room idea. And so we're still meeting in our rented venue. They've been gracious to us uh, to open up the doors and we're following the CDC guidelines on that. Uh, but worship has been a huge element to our church recently. We've started to write our own songs and uh, our worship leaders are uh, just phenomenal. So we've created other worship avenues. So on uh, on Wednesdays at noon, we have a time of worship and prayer through Instagram Live. Uh, Friday at 8 p.m., we have like a worship into the weekend on Instagram Live to say, gather your family. Uh, we kind of say, let worship be like a shower for you. Let it wash away the worries and the stress of the week and let it refresh you as you go in to maintain your Sabbath, um, preparing for Sunday. And we've developed an entire new weekly rhythm as a church. It's online. You can see it, lowermanhattanchurch.com backslash weekly rhythm. Uh, daily devotional through Instagram Live that me and some of our leaders and pastors are doing. Um, we have Monday all churchwide prayer on Google Meet. Um, and then we have those worship times during the week and then live stream on Sunday. Uh, all of our community groups have moved online. And that's been super encouraging. And we've actually opened it up to a lot of people. We're seeing more people join those online community groups. And we're going to be creating just new online groups only because our reach has extended far beyond um, New York City at this point. And so we want to make sure we provide community for those folks. Uh, and we'll be launching online classes in a couple of weeks. The, the message that we've told our church is um, this is a chance to launch a prayer movement. Um, and, you know, so many people are saying, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? 
And we just say, like, we've always been someone that said, we believe in the power of prayer. Now let's do it. Let's see the power of prayer and be a people of prayer. Um, and so for discipleship, you know, we've, we've used two words. It's how do we empower and how do we activate? How do we empower our people to be uh, the, the love of Christ in this new season? And so we interviewed a reporter that was that's on the front lines um, reporting on coronavirus. She actually lived through SARS in Hong Kong. And so her wisdom has been huge for us, just understanding how to navigate that. Um, and then it's activating people's gifts. So we have a round the clock prayer team that um, are receiving prayer requests online and they're contacting those people and praying with them. And then there's a few guys in our church that are creating kind of an online database. They are really concerned about kind of contact info being out there. So they've created this entire new system. And so we're working on launching that to identify the cares in our church the cares connected to our church, and then connecting the dots between those who can meet those needs. Um, when it comes to mission, you know, we, we started a uh, You're Invited series leading up to Easter, uh, which is, you know, perfect timing for this. Um, but we're telling people we're not done inviting, and we've actually seen three to four times the engagement on Sundays with our live stream than we normally would because our people know that when we talk about rest and peace and hope, everyone needs that right now. And so they're, they're tuning in and they're sharing it. And that's been huge. Um, when it comes to our mission, we've started with con kind of concentric circles and say we've, we've hunted down the people in our church who's sick, who needs help, who needs financial assistance. Okay, let's find that. And then we've said, okay, who are you connected to with your neighbors? And then we have, um, you know, a number of partner churches and nonprofits, missionaries around the world. And so we've, I've enlisted someone to follow up with them so we can distribute resources and help that. And the other thing it's really confirmed in us is um, we believe God's called us to be a healing people. You know, like, like Rich um, out in Queens, we, we're in, we really are about to launch a, a healing center um, in the next couple of months. And um, the church has always been on the front lines of this and uh, healthcare system, you know, the healthcare workers are doing a phenomenal job, but the system is very broken. And so we believe this is gonna be an inspiring moment for people to be innovative and to treat it holistically, that, that spiritual, physical, emotional needs can be met in one house. And so we're hoping that a healing center um, gets launched out of this and that on the other side of it, we can help people um, on the front end to be proactive in healthcare and not reactive and uh, and so that's really affirming in us this mission of leveraging our people activating them um, and then enlisting them you know i feel like i'm a general in a command center every day just kind of having this zoom call and this zoom call and this zoom call to try to get our people to go and i'm so encouraged um, the people of god are leaning into the holy spirit and uh, it's a beautiful moment for us, and I'm excited to see how this will cause a revival. I think that's what God's going to birth out of this the way he has in the past. So uh, that's us here at LNCC. Thanks. I uh, love it. Thanks so much, Logan, for sharing that. Um, and I know the pivot that many churches are making to online. I'm going to leave a contact in the chat box for someone who was actually one of the pioneers of online church in the country um, a guy named Neil Smith who happens to live in New York and he's on this call. I'll leave that contact there for anyone who has any online questions as well and uh, about going online and um, all these folks who are sharing, Rich, Jordan, Logan, is it cool if I send out your contacts to different to this entire list afterwards? Thanks guys. I love love what you all are doing and leaning in, especially in this moment. Hey, um, I'm going to shift gears to Edwin Colon, who's a pastor in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, who's the co-founder of the New City Network as well, one of my dearest buds. And he's actually going to be sharing about his context a little bit and then just sharing what, what they're looking to do. And um, you'll hear about how it's a much different context perhaps than, you know, Tribeca. But um, yeah, Edwin, if you can go ahead and just briefly share about your church and, um, and share about kind of what's happening with you guys. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. And thanks for hosting this. Um, I really appreciate what everybody has already said, uh, Jordan, Logan, Rich. Um, I think that that's, wow, I feel like I've been blessed in this conversation, so I really appreciate their insights. Um, at the Recovery House of Worship, we generally deal with a population that's uh, addicted, homeless, or um, just coming from a broken uh, background. I know we all deal with 
uh, broken people, but our people wear their brokenness on their sleeve. And so um, one of the things that we started to realize as we started to communicate as a, a community or as a leadership, when this started to break out, is that we don't just have to consider a virus, COVID-19. We have to consider a disease of addiction. And the disease of addiction is different in that um, we need contact with one another, but that's not allowed now. So what does recovery look like? What does a hug look like? What is a, a walking with life with the person who's struggling with 30 days clean, who just needs a community around him to be able to go in the right direction and, and isolation could be deadly. And so even if he doesn't have the virus, um, he, you know, just because he struggles with addiction, how do we continue to send people to uh, detox and rehab? How do we continue to house the homeless um, that, that stay here or feed the hungry that are reliant on the food that we give? So one of the things that uh, we decided is that we were, we, all right, so this is what I'm about to say is just very unique to us. We decided that um, there are incredible people like Logan and Jordan and Rich who are having, who are far better preachers than I'll ever be and are communicating a beautiful message of the gospel. I have hundreds of messages online and, um, and a good percentage of them have to deal with suffering and struggles um, based on uh, the people that we minister to. So I decided, and I love what Rich said about um, just embracing limits. I decided that uh, spending time creating a service uh, that people can go online to see when there are so many various services. Um, their attraction here at the Recovery House of Worship has never been our music. It's never been our preaching. It's been, it's been um, our connection to each other and sharing each other's burdens, um, walking with each other in uh, temptation and brokenness and doing it, um, looking to the gospel for hope and renewal. So what we decided was that, um, like many of you, we had to close down our services. One thing that I am doing, and I don't know how well this is gonna go over, but a lot of our people who come to our services don't have um, uh, internet access or Facebook or anything like that. So on Sunday service, I'm coming to, uh, I'm telling everybody to stay home every week. I tell everybody to stay home. Last week, we had 30 people here. We fed them, uh, we shared some testimonies, we sung a song and sent them on their way, make sure that everybody was separated as far as they could be, sanitizer and all that other stuff. Um, but next Sunday, I promise that there'll be another 20 or 30 people who haven't been to the church for a lot of weeks who are looking for hope. And um, we'll just be there to let them know where some help is. We've come up with some creative ways in uh, feeding others. Um, that has been uh, really helpful. Uh, we, we've started a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, like um, sort of like a, a McDonald's uh, drive-through kind of thing uh, where people are walking by and uh, grabbing the meals that they need. Um, we, uh, we still feed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families a week. But what we've been doing in order to um, just to expedite that is that we've been like this week, we made 50 bags for the YWCA, 50 bags of food for the women there. And we're trying to go into different places to be able to um, minister and still provide uh, for the, the physical needs that our people have. And like everybody else, uh, we've been uh, having meetings and a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. One of the things that uh, I've been telling our congregation, and this is like a, real near and dear to my heart um, is that we've been saying for the last 20 years here at the recovery house of worship that this building is not the church we've been saying that over and over again this building's not the church we're the church and so we've asked people to now start um moving from being and we have a lot of people who are involved but we've been asking others who haven't been involved we're asking them to uh, use this, never like, never waste a crisis, right? Never squander a crisis. So we're asking those people who've been on the fence, who've been a little bit afraid about um, uh, ministering and discipling others, that they would, uh, that they would uh, actually do this online. So we've been doing trainings online. Like Rich, Rich actually, you inspired me to do this. Um, 
we're doing a morning and evening prayer service. Um, it's interactive. We have breakout rooms. It's really good. Um, and people are able to share with one another. And we're trying to create that sort of NA meeting, uh, but gospel-centered environment. And so that's been really, really helpful to us. We do that five days a week, uh, mornings and evenings. And um, God has been very, very gracious. One of the things that we haven't figured out, because our we've been really stuck on our major financial engine being the Sunday service plate passing, um, is we haven't figured out how to do offerings. So basically, after every meeting, we have every every group just going, "Hey, do the Zelly, do the PayPal, mail it in, you know, put a stamp, a good old fashioned stamp on it, and mail it in." But I don't think we've cracked that nut, and um, that's something that we're still trying to uh, figure out financially how this is going to work out. Um, those are some of the thoughts and the ideas. Um, uh, also, of course, uh, gathering a massive list um, and having people work through that list, and not only having them work through that list, but asking those who they call if there are others to call. Um, and so we've been trying to set up uh, small groups with uh, simple, simple setups with just four questions so that it's as easy for anyone to be able to lead. And I could share about that at some other time, but um, yeah, that's what's been going on. And um, we think that God is doing something really, that this is scary and that this is terrible and that God may be using what Satan uh, is, is looking to use for evil. He'll use it for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. And we're encouraged about the opportunity of revival. Um, that uh, he's stirring up already in the hearts of our people and even beyond our, our walls. So that's, that's what we've been doing in a nutshell. Thanks, Edwin. Um, before we transition to Russell, um, who's also a, a, a church planner and pastor in Brooklyn, I just, uh, I know that Recovery House of Worship is also one of the Hope for New York affiliates. And Hope for New York, of course, is an organization that really works with some of the most vulnerable populations in our city to serve them, um, the nonprofits. And um, they were in touch with them too about what kind of needs there are around some, several of the nonprofits. Um, obviously church, we have to be ready for some of the financial challenges that are coming our way. And um, I, you know, I've been, we'll talk about that in future calls, but I just wanted you to know and how we can end up hopefully being able to redistribute resources. It's beautiful hearing about Jordan, their generosity initiative and, and others, but um, just wanted to keep that on the radar. So we'll talk about that soon, but thanks Edwin. And I'll, I'll also put a link to Hope for New York and some of the stuff that's happening to serve some of the vulnerable populations in our city right now. Um, Russell, uh, and again, sorry guys, it's, um, there's so much content here. Um, this was really, but um, I hope it's been a blessing. Uh, Russ, uh, why don't you go ahead and share just worship, discipleship mission. What are some of your thoughts um, and how you guys have approached it at Hope Brooklyn? Yeah, totally. Uh, thanks so much, Drew, and thanks for everyone who's shared so far. My name is Russ. Uh, I pastor Hope Brooklyn um, in Brooklyn, New York, part of the Hope family of churches. Uh, we're coming up on our third anniversary uh, this April, and so um, a lot of the things that we're trying to do have already been spoken about, and so in the interest of the questions, I thought I would just share two of our main things um, that, uh, that we're trying to really capitalize on. Number one, uh, we're not live streaming our services. And the main reason behind that is we're still a young church with a very um, part-time staff. And so I just didn't feel like we had the, uh, the technical infrastructure to do that. Instead, we're pre-recording and uh, really trying to think through a schedule um, that, is, that is safe, um, that is uh, uh, yeah, a schedule of recording worship and then recording um, sermons that are a little bit shorter, uh, hopefully a little more evangelistic, kind of pulling a page out of uh, Rob Bell circa early 2000s NUMA, um, so trying to make something that's a little uh, artistic in it. Um, and then uh, what we're doing with that, we're, we're sort of sending that out at 11 a.m. to our community. Um, but in tangent to that for discipleship is uh, we're really pushing what we're calling a house church pledge. Um, so for us, the table has always been a very central symbol and metaphor and just practical reality for our community. So food has always been central. We have a, a, a meal every Sunday after our service. Um, our small groups are called tables. They meet around food. 
we never gather unless food is present. And um, so tables were already going before all this broke. And uh, so what we've done is we push this house church pledge saying, hey, pledge that you're going to be tuning in from your house at 11 a.m. Uh, for, our, for our worship service. And then um, we have an incredible team uh, led by our executive pastor, Bryant Nam. Uh, he has a core team that really oversees the table leaders. Um, and we've kind of created like a pyramid scheme in a lot of ways. Uh, so the, the table leaders have been mobilized by Bryant to over, and his team to oversee a region of Brooklyn or the city. And then as people are sort of signing the house church pledge saying, yes, I want to worship at 11 a.m., um, obviously there's a lot more people. Like, for example, say we have 25 people tuning in from the neighborhoods of South Brooklyn. Um, that's too big for people to gather together via Zoom. So we've broken up that table into smaller cell groups, and we're sort of coaching uh, deputies to oversee those cell groups. So the way it works is as we, we make that connection, um, we sort of let you know who's in your cell group. Um, and the point of the cell group is for relational connection. So you have each other's numbers. You're able to text each other during the week um, for spiritual connection. So you're gathering during the week via Zoom to, to pray together um, and for missional ingenuity. So thinking through creative ways, uh, because in your cell group will be people of as close proximity as possible to where you live. And so thinking through, hey, you know the, uh, that, that restaurant on 4th Street. Oh, yeah, I know that restaurant. Well, what would it look like if we all bought gift cards there? So thinking through creative ways to, to bless the neighborhood. So essentially what we're doing is we're putting out um, these services at 11 a.m. And we're coaching our uh, cell group to do one of two things, to either tune in on their own Zoom call and watch the service together. And then, you know, to have your, in your pajamas and, and, and have your breakfast before you so you can eat and, and worship together and then pray afterwards. Or um, if people want to worship uh, in their own house, then they can jump on a Zoom call afterwards just for some food and um, to discuss and to pray together. Uh, so those would probably, I'd say, the two main ways that we're really pushing this. And we've seen a, a really solid success rate um, in terms of people, you know, jumping on, signing the house church pledge, um, building out cell groups. And obviously we're starting to think again beyond this as uh, hopefully these would be some core relationships that are formed that might be able to multiply our tables um, when we're able to start gathering again. And then as it relates with mission, um, the two main ways we're doing this is um, uh, we're, we're at, we've set up a fund, a COVID fund. So anyone who is um, perhaps not hit as hard financially, we're asking to give above and beyond. And for those who have lost their jobs within our community, um, we're like really pushing that this is what it means to be the church, to carry each other's burden. So we have a process by which they can contact our care team, our care crew, and apply for um, some temporary relief. And, uh, and then we've, all, we've always from the start had a, um, um, a, a large percentage of our budget go toward, you know, local justice, uh, the neighborhood. And so we're just mobilizing that a lot faster. So we've sent out surveys to our people to figure out, hey, what industries are you in? Where are avenues that we can participate and give money um, and bless the neighborhood? So uh, we've just been writing checks that way. So those are the main ways I would say that we're trying. Thanks, Russ. Um, yeah, I really love what you guys are doing. Um, we're going to have our last kind of person present. Uh, Sarah Bournes just joined our team in Midtown as Pastor Formation and Mission, and she's really thought through. She's also been working a lot with Ryan Hairston with Forge America, who um, is really an organization that wants to mobilize everyday people for mission and have been thinking about what does radical neighboring look like. And so Sarah's gonna share very briefly. Um, it looks like we're not gonna have as have much time for question and answers guys, but I'll, again, I'll tell you what's next after that. So, but just wanted to have Sarah share and then we'll, we'll um, kind of wind down the conversation. Yeah. Hi all, um, just some things that I've been thinking through even this morning. I was in uh, Luke chapter three with John the Baptist and you know, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight the paths. And then that took me back to Isaiah 40, which was that prophecy. And just thinking through, like, we are just called to be John the Baptist right now. Like, as leaders, I think 
my filter at least is how am I awakening the church and how am I activating the church? And that all of our decisions can be kind of through that lens of how do we awaken and how do we activate? How can we be John the Baptist for this generation as leaders? Um, I was listening to also a podcast this morning that was recorded in January. It was Kelvin Walker. I think I saw you're on this call. Um, it was recorded early January. And um, if you remember, that was the time when all the vision 2020 was kind of coming out and, you know, just this like excitement for what was God going to do in 2020 and clear vision. And since I had the John or John the Baptist in my head, um, it made me think that, you know, repent is actually metanoia, the Greek um, it means look, see differently, to, to turn and to see differently. And so that vision 2020 just came to my mind that, you know, this is a time for us to see differently and to like, it's a different kind of vision 2020 than what we might have thought back in January, but I think the time is for us to see differently. So just thinking through that, awaken and activate. And, you know, the, the analogy of like, if you see a burning building, do you, and it's just you, do you rush into the burning building and try to like douse it with water yourself? Or do you go to the firehouse and like wake up the hundred sleeping firemen and mobilize them and activate them? And so I just really keep coming back to the idea in um, Ephesians 4 that we as leaders are to equip the people for the work of the ministry, that we are not to do a lot of what we've done before. Um, and maybe even rightly so, this is moving us into positions like a lot of us have said of empowering and equipping and retooling our people and launching them out and sending them out like even just the benediction of like now go be the church like do this in your own homes in your own neighborhood um so some of the things that we are doing around that um ryan hairston of forge is leading a radical neighboring uh webinar workshop tonight on zoom um, radical neighboring um you can find that on the hope midtown webpage the link for that zoom call tonight at 8 30. Um, so he'll be talking about just what does it look like to really actually love the people that live right around us because that's about as far as we can go right now um and then i'm leading one on friday on um the, the rule of life for lack of a better word but rule of life for the corona a rule of life for the time of corona how do we develop new rhythms new practices um this is upending a lot of us in terms of our schedule so what are the new practices that we can have? And it might look completely different than even a couple weeks ago. So rule of life on Friday night at 8.30. So we're just leaning into like, how can we mobilize our people on mission? So the radical neighboring will probably do that a couple times. And then the, just the formation. Um, I think you all would agree that like nothing forms us like suffering and like crisis. So how are we using this time as such a key opportunity for discipleship and for um, this formation. Um, and I think that comes down to our personal practices as well as our corporate practices. A lot of you have mentioned the corporate practices of new rhythms for your church family, but also just our personal practices. How are we equipping our people when we don't see them face to face on Sunday anymore? How are we equipping them to have the spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices that will enable them to stay strong in this time? You know, like this is, we're, we're not the ones discipling them anymore. The coronavirus is discipling them. So I've been asking people like, how is the coronavirus discipling you? Um, and how are we being shaped by this? How are we being formed by this? Are we being formed into fear? Are we being formed by faith? Um, and another question that I've been asking is, how would the enemy want to take you out right now? Um, so I think just those pressing questions, pushing people, um, how would the enemy want to take you out right now? If, you know, think screw tape letters analogy, like how would the enemy you know, try to just get at you right now. And that could be everything from distraction to real like harmful numbing kinds of things. Um, but I think we, we have to care for our people's like very personal um, spiritual disciplines. So I would say asking those hard questions, those like thought provoking questions is one of the key things that we can do on our Zoom group. So how is the coronavirus sh shaping you, forming you, discipling you? Um, how would the enemy be trying to take you out right now? And I have, um, I think a list of about 12 others. So if you would like that, I can send that along as well. That's it for me. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, there were a number of questions and comments happening in the chat and far more than I can kind of collate and address right now. But thank you for all the folks who shared 
uh, they put all their contact information in the chat. And so if you have any questions in particular for the folks, you can go ahead and ask them. Um, uh, just kind of some next steps. Um, sorry guys, if you hear my voice breaking, I've just been kind of a weepy mess the past couple of days. Um, you know, we need each other um, more than ever. I think we're in a season where we are, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's more to come for us. And I think, um, uh, I, I heard Ed Stetzer, he had this phrase where he said, you know, now's not the time to be thinking about the survival of, of my church. Now's the time to be thinking of how can we live and be the people of God in our city. And um, thank you for joining this call. I, I do want to say we, we do plan on, um, one of the reasons why there was a lot of content was just, I just knew that it was probably helpful to have a lot of people coming together. Uh, with technology nowadays, we can share so many resources, which is a great gift. And um, after kind of seeing the interest in this group, we just, oh, I decided you. that we would host another group next week as well. Um, Mike, Mike Keller from Redeemer Lincoln Square, Michael Carrion, Promised Land up in the Bronx as well as City to City, as well as Ed Stetzer will be joining us on that call. And uh, we just, I think we need to keep coming together. I think we'll do our best. There's so many resources right now that we can share, which is tremendous guys. And we need each other. And for me, I mean, I want to leverage as much of the giftedness of this room that we're in right now um, and our congregations to pull together for this moment in our city. And uh, if we can do that together, leave our egos at the side, I think God can do something really special. Um, uh, with that said, so, so really related to mission and prayer, we'll be, uh, um, I'll probably be, you know, um, emailing out about different initiatives that might come out related to those two things that we can really galvanize around. And I know Logan already talked about prayer as many of you already have and mission, all the creative ways that right now you all are serving the city, raising money, um, serving those in need. Um, it's really a, a joy to hear. So um, one of the last things that I thought we could hear about was Kathy Keller. Um, the Kellers actually live on the island and I live on Roseville Island as well. And uh, she, she brought up this idea for Easter Sunday. I know that many of you are probably already thinking about Easter Sunday. And um, she brought up this idea for us to do on Roseville Island. And I thought it was such a unique idea. I'm like, I'm all in for it. And I thought, what if the broader Church of New York could also participate in this? And so, Kathy, uh, if you're still on, if you wouldn't I'm mind here. just sharing your idea about I'm here. what the church could collectively do in New York City on Easter Sunday. Um, that would be great. Well, I've been listening to all of you, and you have, have an amazing number of um, particulars. But for a moment, I wanted to pull back and think of something that was broader, that would involve the entire church, um, that would involve all the Christians across the city and all the boroughs, if we could possibly do it. Um, you might have heard that Chicago had a sing-along uh, in the loop. I'm not no. sure if any of you have heard about that. Um, I mean, they all came. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's a, yeah, someone just yeah, yeah, can mute it. Somebody okay. mute themselves. So okay, mute, mute everybody. Um, yes, okay. All right, fine. Um, it, it occurred to me that on Easter Sunday, we're not going to be in our major, in our usual worship uh, places. We're not going to be able to um, uh, maybe normally do on Easter Sunday. So what if we could reach as many of our people as possible and just get everyone, pick your time, it doesn't matter, when, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, to come out on your balcony if you have one, to stand by an open window if you don't. And... Uh, just sing Jesus Christ has risen today together as loud as you can. You might not hear anybody else singing. There might not be anywhere one near you. Or you might. Who knows? I mean, maybe the song will just rise above New York and everyone will hear it. Who's to say? I don't know. It depends on how many people we get. And then just do a really brief um, liturgy. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Death is swallowed up in victory. Something that would be very simple to remember, we'd send it around to everybody. I've been collecting names on Roosevelt Island already from some people, but I don't know how you feel about that, but it seems like a simple doable thing and something that would be 
demonstrative of our unity across all the lines, the nominational, racial, economic, all the, the different programs that are being um, pulled together by all of you. It sounds wonderful. I've been on the call the whole time listening to you. But this just seemed like something tangible that we could do. And I don't know how much interest is there is in it or not. I said something to Drew and he was sort of, well, we all know Drew, off and running with it. So that's the only reason I'm on this call, to see if there's anybody who's interested in doing it. I'm going to stand on my balcony and sing Jesus Christ is risen today. But if anybody else wants to do it or thinks their church might want to do it, what do you think? Um, I think everyone's muted, <laughs> but, but, um, here's, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of this. I think it would be just a special reminder for all of us in the midst to be able to proclaim, uh, Dr. Steve, is, is it okay for people to be shouting out? Um, is that okay? Or is that, as long as we're yeah, absolutely. I, I think as, as long as we uh, get a few feet away from each other, we'd be just fine. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Great. Um, so here's, here's what the kind of some next steps are for today then. Um, I'll actually ask Kathy to prepare the liturgy, the common liturgy that we can do, and we'll have a time. And I'll email everyone the details for next week's call. Again, you don't have to jump on again if you want, but we'll be hearing again more stories about what people are learning and going through. Gosh, so much has happened in the city in just one week. Uh, I mean, our team was feel, feeling like this past week has felt like 10 years. And, um, but we're gonna have another call next week and uh, I'll send out an email just inviting people. If your church would like to participate, again, it's just gonna be, obviously you'll do whatever you do on Sunday with Easter Sunday and Holy Week, but um, if you'd like to participate in this common liturgy, and it'd be great to try to canvas the city with people who would be able to proclaim from their balconies and rooftops that Christ is risen and that um, he's the King of Kings. And so, um, hey guys, thanks for joining us. It's 2.30 right now. Uh, again, I appreciate with all that's happening for you to take out your time. Uh, I'll also send the recording of this call and uh, we'll give you details about next week. And um, if there's any creative things that you all are doing or things that you want to share, feel free to let me know. And again, as we can keep these calls going, mostly as we kind of lean into this next season, again, I don't know what, what things will bring, but this is our moment, church, to be the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, would, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to see through all of this, his resurrection power proved to be real and true, and, um, and we are his vessels. So.